Good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you today. I want to welcome you if you're visiting with us for the first time. I want to begin with a, a basic truth that runs through the whole scripture. I'll, I'll explain it to you a little bit more as we move on. But that is that when you read the Bible, when you look at all of the stories, and there are many, many stories in there, what you see from beginning to end is a basic truth that sort of comes to the surface and prevails over everything else that's happening in the Bible. And that truth can be summarized in two words. And these are the words, God wins. That's the, that is the ultimate story of the Bible. And you see it all through the Bible. You look at the very end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, and you have a bunch of Christians who are undergoing these horrible, horrible persecutions at the hands of Rome. And the statement that's made when it's all said and done is, you're going to be okay because God wins. You go back to the first book of the Bible. The whole idea of God overcoming the darkness with his light is the statement, God wins. Or how about the book of Job? There's a book for you where there is this man who is very anxious about the well-being of his children in the world and before God. And you see in this book the unfolding of this adversary that the scripture simply calls Satan, which is the Hebrew word for adversary. And how he wreaks havoc throughout the whole world. How people are devastated by his handiwork. And how he seeks to steal and kill and destroy. And how Job is caught off guard by this, not understanding what's going on. But when he finally gets through all of the foolishness that people try to explain to him why there are bad things happening in his life, and in essence how it all comes down to him being a bad person, God finally brings him into his counsel, and when it's all said and done, says this, Job, I win. I'm going to win. So you need to trust me. God wins. That's the whole story of the scripture. Look at this is what the Proverbs means up on the screen. When Solomon says this, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. In other words, the whole earth is a big struggle. It's a wrestling match. It's people trying to exert their will in, in the home or in an office space or in a nation or in a huge region. People trying to exert their will over other people to the devastation of countless innocent people. We just saw it this week up in Oregon, didn't we? Who someone comes in with all of whatever's motivating him to exert power which is what that's all about, and gain stardom by destroying human life. And we could see that, and our minds go to a lot of places. Mostly our hearts go to the people who have lost loved ones. But we see the earth in this fashion, and I promise you, all the laws in the world won't help. Because he broke laws. It's a big struggle. The earth is a wrestling match. And you and I are caught up in this whole wrestling match. And devastation after devastation comes in a thousand different ways in the lives of people. But what the scripture would teach us, if we would look at the whole scheme of it and just try and say, all right, Lord, what are you, what are you telling me in all of this? It would be those two words. God wins. Now, we're continuing our story in the book of Acts. We're looking at the back part of chapter 11. Now, chapter 11 is, in effect, several small stories. And what these stories are going to do in sort of the big picture of, of Acts is they're going to move the narrative of Acts along. They're going to bring to conclusion some things, but they're also going to set us up for entering into chapter 13. So chapter 12 is going to bring everything to a conclusion in the first section of Acts. Chapter 11 that we're looking at now is going to set up the next section of Acts, 13 to 28, chapters 13 to 28. So we're going to see some pieces moving, some things getting in place. God is lining up some stuff, getting ready to, to do some bigger things than anybody expected. So it's moving the story along. But for our purposes today, what I want you guys to see is that in these little stories, they're all interconnected. And they're all really good, really positive things. We're going to look at each one of them in a moment. And we see these things that are unfolding. We go, that's a great, that's great that that's happening. But what you need to know as we're going through this, and we'll see this in the very first uh, uh, verse in this section, is that all of these wonderful events that are 
happening are all linked together primarily through one very negative event. And that is the murder of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He's killed for his faith. The first person, history tells us, is killed for his faith. But from his death, God is going to bring good. Now, why is that? Did God bring his death? No. A devastating world, an enemy named Satan, people trying to exercise their will, not wanting others to express their opinions and so forth. That's what brings about his death. It's a broken, dangerous world. But even in that, God in his sovereignty is going to bring about good things. Why is that? Because God always wins. He always wins. People devise their plans, but when it's all said and done, it's God's purposes that will prevail, that will win the day. Now, let's look at some of these things that come from this. and we'll, we'll, I'll give these to you, and then we'll just kind of read through the verses that talk about it. So here's the first thing that comes. Now, remember, we're talking about a person being killed for his faith. That's the negative that happens. That's what the world brings about, this devastation. So what does God do from that negative? Here's the first thing. The first thing God brings about from that tragedy, that criminal act, is this. God brings about new life for people who are far from him. New life. Through the death of one person comes the eternal life, the salvation, the re relationship restored with God for many, many, many people. You see sort of a picture of Jesus in that, don't you? Through the death of one person for the sake of, of the faith comes about new life, restoration of relationship with the Father for many, 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 many people. And not people who knew anything about the Father. That's the interesting thing. It's not people who are reading you know, Jewish scriptures, reading Torah, understood a Messiah would come, all of these things. It's from people who didn't have that knowledge necessarily. Now let's, let's look at the verses and kind of unfold this a little bit up on the screen. Beginning in verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen, remember he was killed and persecution broke out against the followers of Jesus. They traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch telling the message only to the Jews. Now, let me throw a map up there. And what you see is that when Stephen is martyred in Jerusalem by the hands of the leadership, again, willful people trying to suppress others and express their will because the whole world is people trying to exercise their will, usually to the devastation of other people. Did you know that? When I try to exercise my will against your will, there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser. That's true in marriage. It's true in raising children. It's true in friendships. It's true in your neighborhood. It's true in your job. It's true everywhere. When I say, I want my way juxtaposed to your way, there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser. And so it's interesting that the father gets his way of winning a world back to himself, not through exercising a power to dominate and suppress, but rather through himself becoming the sacrifice for sin. It's amazing. It is truly the most remarkable thing in the history of humanity. That God himself becomes a human being, not to push me into something, to conform me to some set of principles he wants, but rather, if I can say it this way, to stand in the way of the bullets so that I can have life. That's how God does it. That's what the cross is all about. So as the persecution commences, the church spreads out. It goes north into Antioch. It goes sort of northwest into Cyprus, an island. And it goes due west toward the Mediterranean on the coast of the eastern Mediterranean in an area known as Phoenicia, up what, what would be Lebanon by and large now, and, and a little south of that. It spreads out. And as it spreads out, they're taking the news about Jesus to other Jewish people who live in all those regions. But look at how the story goes from here. 
Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, Cyrene, northern coast, west of Egypt on, on Africa, on the Mediterranean, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, meaning people who were not Jewish, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Now look at the results. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. What's a great number? It's a lot of people. I don't know. But because Stephen was martyred, a persecution commenced. And with the persecution, people spread out and begin to talk about Jesus in other regions. And when that happened, there were another group of people who said, well, we can talk to people who are not already Jewish too, can't we? Can't we talk to people who are from other parts of the world? They should hear this good news too. Now, the way the Bible would describe that is those people were very far from the Lord. But there is no length that God's arm of love and grace won't stretch. And so he begins to send the gospel everywhere. People who are far from God hear about Jesus and commit their life, come in faith and have new life. And it begins with the death of Stephen. Now, very quickly, I want to just give you some information about Antioch because it has a role throughout the rest of the book of Acts. Antioch, at the time of Luke's writing, is a giant city. It has roughly half a million people, which is huge in terms of the ancient, ancient culture. Half a million people. It is a major city for Rome, but it is also a city where there is a lot of industry and a lot of education, a lot of learning. And one of the things that happened is the Jewish community spread up north into Antioch. Antioch is, is 60 miles west of Aleppo. If you've read about Aleppo in the news, it's one of the places that ISIS uh, took out and, and pretty much devastated. We had missionaries there at one time who got out alive, fortunately. But it is west of there, on the Orontes River. Um, cities were often built on rivers because you need water to drink and for irrigation. And so it becomes this huge, huge city. But it has another title throughout history, and that title is the Cradle of Christianity. And the reason it is called the Cradle of Christianity is because from the time that this occurs, Luke writes, you know, a few decades after this happens, but from the time it occurs to now, there is a large, strong Christian population in that city, still there today. Now, Antioch is going to become sort of a home base for missionary endeavors that are going to go out from that point. And it makes a lot of sense because now when this happens, there are suddenly many, many, many believers in Jesus in Antioch. So everything has changed for that whole city and really the region around it. Now here's the second thing that happens also related. The second thing that happens along with new life for these people and people who are far from God is renewal. Renewal of calling into ministry. Now, this is not an uncommon event. God calls people to do things. He puts his, his hand on people and he guides people. He has special things for different people to do. I believe every one of you, God has a calling on your life. Something that he calls you to do. And it might be for a month or it might be for a year or it might be for five years or it might be something he says, this is what I want you to invest your life in from this day forward. Your whole life's going to change from this day forward, because you're going to do this. That's just simply a calling. And God equips you for that. He leads you into that. He resources you for that. He guides you through that. And as you're faithful in that calling, God brings about fruitfulness. He brings about things in your life. He blesses people around you. He brings people to know Jesus. That's what a calling looks like. But you probably also know that it's very easy to have the Lord call you into something and then you begin to move with the Lord in this thing and then something happens. And it can be all kinds of things that happen. But I'm walking with the Lord. I'm sensing his presence. I'm wanting to do it. I'm starting to walk by faith. And then I get sidelined by something. It knocks me backward. And I refocus on the old life. Have you ever seen that? And the calling that the Lord has for me, I sort of 
not forget about, but it kind of goes in the back burner because I say to myself, well, I got to take care of this right here. Right here, right now. This is my focus. And I want you to know when that happened, when that happens, which it does, God doesn't say, all right, fine, I'll find somebody else. What the Father says is, okay, I'll let you, let you run that path for a while, but then I'm going to woo you back because I got something that I've created you to do, something that you're going to do in a wonderful way because I fashioned you to do it. From before there was a heaven and an earth, I had you in my mind seeing you do this thing that's going to bring beauty to the world, blessing to humanity, glory to me, and unbelievable fulfillment, fulfillment to you. He created you for those things. Did you know that? He didn't create you for living in a rat race. He created you for all of those other things. Now, we live in a rat race. But you have a calling on your life. But it's so easy to move away from that calling. Now, let me just make sure you're not hearing something I'm not saying. I'm not saying now you sit back and begin to sweat it out and say, well, gosh, God, I don't know what you want me to do, but please tell me because I'm getting kind of anxious here. The Father will gently lead you into it. He'll speak to you. He'll call you. Sometimes it's almost like we fall right into it. But we know what it is because he speaks to our heart and we say, this is from the Lord. This is something I need to be doing. And sometimes when we lose our way, it's crisis or tragedy that gets our attention again or sends the wheels of God in motion that bring us back to renew the ministry the Father created you for. And that's exactly what happens here. Let's read the story some more. Now, this is going to tie into this, you know, breakout of the faith in this this big metropolitan city of Antioch. Up on the screen. News, no, follow along. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. News of what? News of all of these people coming to know Jesus, including people who are not of a Jewish background or are not God-fearers, had converted to Judaism. People far from this. So they sent Barnabas to Antioch. We better check this out. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Now notice what he does. He goes in and he doesn't say, okay, now here's the six things you guys need to be doing to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. He just goes in and says, what the Lord is doing, I encourage you to keep walking in there. He doesn't tell them what they're supposed to do. He doesn't give them a bunch of regulations to follow. He doesn't say, oh, that's awesome, you came to Jesus. But now, here's the seven things you should be doing in order to make God pleased with you and for him to to make you grow as a Christian because you're not a disciple unless you're doing all these things. That's what I got, but that's not what Barnabas does. What Barnabas does is simply encourage them, meaning he tries to fill them with courage to pursue what the Father has begun in their life. Do you see the big difference? It's what we're supposed to be doing. The Bible, more than anything else other than love, tells us to encourage one another. That doesn't mean here's how you live. That means what I see the Father doing in you, I just encourage you to keep walking in. And if I can be a resource for that, I want to be. See, one is exercising my control. Here's what you need to do now. I give you this task. That's me exercising my control over you. That's very different than me saying, I see the Father at work in you, and I want to help you walk in that any way I can. That's me becoming more like Jesus and being willing to be a servant instead of trying to be a Lord. There's one Lord, and his name's not Kevin. Raise your hand if you know that. You you shouldn't need to raise your hand that fast. Now let's read on. Talking about Barnabas. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Now apparently, as he comes, even more come to the Lord. It's this chain reaction. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus. It's in Turkey. To look for Saul. You remember him, right? And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were 
called Christians first at Antioch. Now, here's more of the chain reaction. There's a martyrdom. People spread out. They begin to talk to people like them because that's what we do. Jews go out and they talk to their fellow Jews. That's how we are as people. We talk to people who look like us, think like us. That's just where we start. Nothing wrong with that. But then others of them say, yeah, but there's a whole lot of other people who don't know about Jesus. They start talking to them. Suddenly, there's this huge breakout of people coming to know Jesus Christ. It's so big, it gets back to, to uh, Jerusalem, and they say, Barnabas, go check it out. He goes, he sees it, he's awestruck by what the Lord is doing. He encourages them to stay faithful in what the Lord is doing. And then he says, these people are going to need some help. I remember a young man named Saul. I heard that 14 years ago, he had left this region to go home to Tarsus, his hometown. I'm going to Tarsus, and I'm going to get him because God had a call on that guy's life. And I'm bringing him in here. Ministry for Saul is being renewed. God has something for him. He's done some stuff. He knows God has a calling on his life. But for some reason, he's gone home. He went deep down into Arabia for three years and then moves back up through Jerusalem, heads to southern Turkey, Tarsus, and he stays there for a decade and a half. What's he doing? Why isn't he engaged in ministry? I don't know what's going on. Maybe he is. Maybe it's a resting time. Sometimes God will just say, you need a break and set people aside to catch a, a breath. But whatever it is, it is now time for him to be renewed back into what God's called him to do. And this all happens as chain events because of the death of Stephen. Ministry has been renewed. God has a ministry for you. God has a calling on your life. And there is something that God desires for you to walk in that is going to bring beauty to the world around you, blessing to the lives of people, glory to God, and intense, wonderful satisfaction to you as you serve the Lord. By the way, when it says they're first called Christians in Antioch, that word is a very interesting word. It's actually from a Latin word. And what it simply means is servants of Messiah. That would be a perfect translation of that word out of the Greek New Testament, servants of Messiah. So they see these people following, worshiping, ready to do whatever Jesus wants to do within them or around them. And here's the third thing. Through all of this, and this all comes into the history, what was happening, because remember, it's a broken world, and stuff happens, and often bad stuff happens. The third result of this, which fits into their story at the time, is that help comes for people who were in need. Help is going to come from all of this, from the events we've seen, help is going to come for hurting, hurting, hurting people. Now let's read, and then I'm going to give you a little background on it. We're in verse 27 now of Acts 11. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Now, just know your geography. They really went north, but since Jerusalem was considered where God sort of lives, everything is going down from Jerusalem. Even if you're going north, even if you're gaining elevation, it's, they would always say you go down from Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the city of God. It's the mountain of God. So they say they go down. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. Now, here's what's going on. Several ancient historians tell us that throughout Claudius's reign, the emperor of Rome at the time from 41 A.D. to 54 A.D., that throughout the region at various places, never the whole region at once, never all of the Roman Empire, but at different areas of Rome, there were famines. Several historians talk about famine happening in Egypt, famine happening in the Fertile Crescent area, particularly focusing on Jerusalem. Jo um, Josephus, a Jewish historian, talks about famine hitting Jerusalem and makes the statement that, and these are his words, many people 
died. So this great famine where people are starving in Jerusalem. There's talk of famine in parts of Africa during Claudius's reign. It's all over the place. And so there's another historian uh, in the first century, kind of in the first century, named Suetonius, who was a Roman. And Suetonius tells us kind of what's behind all this. He simply says, during the reign of Caesar Claudius, there were, quote, persistent droughts. In other words, the weather turned. They didn't get the rain they needed for their crops. They could only irrigate so much from the rivers around them. And suddenly, crops began to fail. And as crops began to fail, people began to go hungry. And as they failed year after year, people began to starve and eventually die. That's the context. Now, that is happening while all of these other things are happening, because we live in a broken world, don't we? And sometimes it's just nature that's broken that causes people problems. So there has been predicted famine, and history tells us that there was famine all over the region because of drought during Claudius' time. But look what happens. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. They did this, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Now catch the situation. The gospel spreads out from Jerusalem, goes to the Jewish world. Then it goes to the Gentile world, the Greek world, they would have called it. And as it spreads out, many, many people come to faith. Jerusalem hears this and sends Barnabas, who sees it and is awestruck and says, we're going to need some help, helping these people walk with the Lord, encouraging them in their faith, teaching them a little bit more about all that Jesus has done. So he renews Saul back into the ministry. As Saul is there, and they're probably teaching them about the love of Jesus throughout all of these people in these regions, other than Judea and specifically Jerusalem, they say, you know, the people in Jerusalem are starving. Let's bring together some money, some provisions, and let's send it to them through Paul and Barnabas. Let's just sort of commission them to take all of this stuff they would have taken probably a dozen other people with them. But let's commission these two guys to take it all back to Jerusalem. Do you see the circle of events that's going on here? Jerusalem is going to be blessed. Judea around it is going to be blessed. Instead of starving, people are going to live. And how does it happen? How is Jerusalem saved, rescued? Because years before, they had killed a man for no reason other than believing in Jesus. God wins. God brings good out of the devastating bad that we see in our world. We may feel grief. We may feel anger. We may feel sadness. We may feel confusion. But one reality that exists from the beginning until the end is that no matter what happens, ultimately, God wins. He always wins. And here is what we need to understand. When God wins, love wins. Truth wins. Justice wins. Blessing wins. When God wins, everything good wins. Now, we may not see it in this life, but we will definitely see it in the next life. I'm going to close with a verse you may be very familiar with. It's the Apostle Paul, who was once called Saul. We just read about him. He's writing to the church at Rome, also undergoing some pretty bad persecution. And he gives them this very simple encouragement at the end of chapter 8. He says, we know that in all things, all things. God works for the good of those who love him. Insert the word, trust him. I know he loves me, so I'm going to just hang on to him. God does good for those who love him. 
who have been called according to his purposes. No matter what happens, God wins. Thank you.